Good morning and welcome to the University of Cambridge's 31st Alumni Festival. Um, this is day one, session one, so uh, we're going to start on a high. Uh, I'm Gabby Sumner, I'm campaign director for Cambridge Children's Hospital and I'm delighted to be introducing today's talk which features Dr Rob Hoytikul and Dr Louise Allen. Dr Rob Hoytikul is the clinical director for Cambridge Children's Hospital. He's a consultant paediatric gastro gastroenterologist and he was the divisional director for women and children's services at Addenbrooke's. Dr Louise Allen is a consultant paediatric ophthalmologist. She is an associate lecturer at the University of Cambridge and a member of the paediatric and academic subcommittee of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Louise is also a specialist advisor to the National Screening Committee. Cambridge Children's Hospital is a transformational partnership between the University of Cambridge and two NHS trusts, Cambridge University Hospitals NHS Trust, known as Addenbrooke's, and Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust, which you might hear referred to as CPFT. We have a bold vision that will be enabled by, by government funding and by philanthropy, and earlier this year we launched a new fundraising campaign. Cambridge Children's Hospital will be built on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus and it will open in 2025. We would welcome questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end of the session. But with that, I will hand over to Rob. Thank you very much, Gabby. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to start um, this uh, alumni festival. Um, with what we think is a, a, a truly innovative and um, novel way of managing children. What I want to tell you about um, before uh, Louise uh, tells you some more specific details about innovation and opportunities that I think this hospital will offer is the way that we see the development of, of child health uh, progressing in Cambridge but also around the region and, in our view, uh, nationally. So we've set out a, as uh, Gabby says, uh, a bold vision. I want to talk you through that. Um, I want to give you a, a little bit of background on, on mental and physical health and the integration of what we think is, is key in child health. I want to tell you something about the project itself and um, research uh, and innovation that will integrate with the provision of of healthcare. So what are we about um, with our vision? And this has been a long time in the coming. People have been talking about a children's hospital in Cambridge for well over 20 years. The opportunity to bring together inpatient care for children with physical and mental health, however, has really only uh, uh, come to the fore in the last four or five years. The opportunity of merging wards on the Fullbourne site, currently providing regional mental health with reproviding the inpatient services at Addenbrooke's in a purpose-built, innovative building where we care for children as a whole, together with our colleagues from mental health, um, in, a, in a design that we think is going to be unique globally in that children will share spaces on wards with both mental and physical health clinicians, nurses, therapists working on um, improving their health together. So this is a, a key element of our vision. At the centre of it, of course, is, is child and family care. We are hoping and expecting that um, we will care as much as possible for children closer to home. We want to integrate our um, pathways with the community and with schools. And of course, uh, COVID has given us uh, a real insight into the opportunities of telehealth and remote monitoring to allow us to provide care, not just in Cambridge, not just in this hospital, but across the region. We currently provide essentially all of the regional subspecialist care for children uh, across the region. One and a half million children and, and, and growing numbers, many of whom are still having to travel into London, will have the opportunity with this uh, development to have their care provided in region. The other key and core element of this vision is the integration of research dedicated to child health and to diseases of children. Our primary focus is around early detection, prevention, early intervention, and Louise will specifically talk about the opportunities in eye disease around this. 
We expect with the richness of this campus and the partners across the biomedical campus in particular to be able to use those cutting edge treatments that very often are developed in adults, for adults, in children. So that what we're expecting to do is to use medical technology and Cambridge University bandwidth and, and innovation to try and turn healthcare on its head, if you like, to think about healthcare in a new way, thinking about early detection and pre prevention for life. And I will say a, a little more about this um, in a few research slides towards the end of the, end of the talk. So why physical and mental health? And, and it won't have escaped anyone, I don't think, globally that the impact of um, uh, COVID and, and uh, lockdown on adolescent and, and childhood mental health is a real and significant crisis. But not only is there a genuine mental health crisis, it is also clear, both in childhood and adult health, physical health, that the impact of mental health on outcomes is absolutely critical. So over 10% of young people will live with a long-term physical condition. And of course, the survivors and our ability to create survivors has substantially increased over the last 10 or 20 years. And so coping with these conditions, managing with these conditions in the long term, is in large part down to resilience, uh, well-being, emotional uh, well-being, and, and um, capability of, of understanding and, and managing the mental health around the challenges with, with chronic complex disease. So we feel that is in this new build, in this new vision, it is absolutely key that we see children as a whole, that we manage them together with our mental health colleagues from the earliest diagnosis right through to the management of their long-term conditions as adults. How does that actually work in terms of the design of the building? Well, we feel that integrating mental and physical health is, is partially about design, but also a fundamental change in how we approach care. So we've worked with some outstanding designers um, and healthcare planners over the last six months in designing spaces that will be shared by patients, by staff, by families across mental and physical health, rather than the typical siloed uh, care of children uh, in separate mental health units, we will have age-based ward integration so that children with eating disorders will be nursed alongside children with cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, teenagers nursed alongside teenagers. We want to provide the sort of dignity and access that we feel mental health deserves. We will have sensory rooms, de-escalation areas that are accessible to both physical and mental health. And of course, we are using families and, and children and, and service users to design and uh, input into the, uh, the, these spaces that they will ultimately get to use. And we have had fantastic support across our region from families and children. In some ways more important, however, is the, is the approach to care. Rather than um, a siloed physical health approach uh, and mental health, we want to try and develop a workforce that uses a universal language, uses skills of both mental and physical health training to approach the child as a whole. We are keen and we are developing and working already on integrated pathways where mental and physical health will manage and understand patients from the very, very earliest problem, whether that is around eating disorders, around early infant feeding, or functional physical health disorders um, in teenagers. And a large part of this, and um, the design is certainly um, focusing on maintaining a, uh, a, a, a fixed envelope and, and making this both feasible and affordable, is on minimizing the stay of children and families in this hospital. Hence our focus on recovery, hence our focus on integration with community to support, the, to support these children in their own homes as soon and as quickly as possible. I've put up a couple of examples because as we've um, talked about this vision, we have had fantastic support, um, both from around the country, locally, and internationally. And these are just some of the initial examples where opportunities have arisen to change the way we think about caring for children. In my own specialty, a group of um, uh, adults with lived experience in IBD a social enterprise has stepped up and helped us 
to provide information by children with inflammatory bowel disease for children and families with inflammatory bowel disease. We've had creative offers of um, drawings and interaction with young, younger children to help parents and families explain the onset and diagnosis of a long-term long uh, uh, condition. We've had actually one of the audience me members, a GP from uh, the West Country, approach us around um, some fantastic work that is being done on early understanding of emotions in, in schools and, and with health visitors. These are all things that I think are key in our understanding and management of physical health conditions that we've never really had access to. And finally, um, a concept that, that is better known in the US, recovery college uh, in adults from our colleagues in CPFT, the Mental Health Trust. We are keen to launch and develop the first discovery college, which is something that will focus on recovery and preparation of children and families with chronic conditions about coping and managing um, with these conditions, not just understanding interventions, medications, uh, physical interventions, but to deal with the lived experience, to deal with the um, uh, understanding and management of these, of these conditions in schools with their peers at home. So the focus is trying to shift uh, away from pure medical uh, and, and physical approaches to health to integrate um, an understanding that uh, we hope will lead to better outcomes. So a short word about uh, our research ambitions, and um, I'm delighted to be able to, to work with Professor David Rowich um, in developing the, the Cambridge Children's Research Institute, where, as I said, we are trying to shift the curve from treating and chasing conditions in adult uh, and older age to being, becoming more preventative uh, and intervening early in life. So rather than uh, developing uh, uh, treatments and, and um, management of diseases in, in adult age, we want to change that to uh, an early intervention. And our expertise, and of course the campus expertise in uh, genomic medicine, is already providing some outstanding results with early whole genome screening of infants who are seriously ill in either the neonatal intensive care unit or the pediatric intensive care unit is leading to early diagnosis, repurposing of medications, and uh, an improvement in outcomes. So the focus for us is identifying and intervening in infants and, and neonates at a time when we think we can make a long-term income, uh, when we can make a long-term long impact. So the concept is really different. We're looking at the adult types of diseases, where is their origin, both in physical health and in mental health. And one of the uh, focuses of our mental health research ambition is the understanding and better management of early adverse life events. As the early, early slide showed, a significant proportion of adult onset mental health occurs in adolescence. We don't understand how that is triggered. We don't understand the factors that lead to that early onset. So our Cambridge Children Research Institute will include a number of different areas of expertise. Genomics will, will lead the way, but we will focus on neurodevelopmental and mental health uh, research. We will focus on uh, childhood cancer, together with our colleagues in the adult cancer unit, uh, as well as perinatal uh, and early um, intrauterine events, diabetes and obesity, and infection and inflammatory disease control. I've got two or three slides just to illustrate how our project is coming along. These, des these are the key design principles that we've used with our partners to develop the building that we, f we, th we feel will give an outstanding uh, accommodation to improve outcomes for, for children over the next uh, decades. So the focus is on making the building playful, adaptable, sustainable, to provide a healing environment, to provide integrated wards which will care for children together. There's a real focus on access to the outdoors and to make the space welcoming, to make it feel less like a hospital, to smell less like a hospital. In fact, today is the uh, day that our design team are submitting the planning applications for a five-floor hosp hospital. 
The upper two floors will be the wards where will be the, the ward areas which are integrated between physical and mental health. And we've got a hot floor where all of the um, day unit and, and theatre activity is, is co-located in a way that we can only dream about at the moment on the Addenbrooke's campus, where child health is provided in multiple different locations scattered through the hospital in and amongst adult services. The sort of spaces we are envisaging on the upper floors will focus on age uh, appropriate uh, space and activities where um, uh, areas will be integrated, there will be access to fresh air to exercise uh, and the building will sit just opposite um, the new Rosie Hospital in the available space that uh, is part of the uh, Addenbrooke's campus development. So we believe, and I think Louise will illustrate with um, innovative examples, that there is really only one space that this could flourish and develop in. We believe that the, the Cambridge Children's Hospital, with its integrated mental health, with its access to innovation and the smartest minds, um, is perfectly placed to flourish on the, on the Addenbrooke's campus. You know that we've developed um, uh, a broad-ranging campus with AstraZeneca just completing their building, with Papworth, the LNB, and of course, um, plans to develop a, a cancer hospital in due course. So I'm delighted to hand over to Louise to give you some specific examples around early intervention uh, in childhood that we think will underpin some of our vision for this hospital in the future. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much, Rob, for that introduction. I'll, I'll try and pick up on a few of the things that you've said um, which relate to the ophthalmology practice. So it's incredibly frustrating as a clinician when you see children coming too late to help them. There are a lot of conditions which if you pick them up early, you can stop children from becoming blind. And in acknowledgement of this, we have the, the National Screening Committee has set up lots of screening programs to try and catch children before the problem starts or, or right at, just at the time when you can actually treat children well and prevent visual impairment long term, something that's going to last the, the rest of their life. Um, and it's this frustration, I suppose, that has driven me to try to uh, create some innovations because ophthalmology is a very high tech subject, but none of the tech has been made for children and none of it is relevant to children. So the question is, how can we bring the tech to the children to improve detection? Because screening is done by non-ophthalmologists, it's done by GPs, it's done by midwives. How can we make technology work for them so that we can pick up these kids early? So why is effective eye screening so important? Well, it's because vision is the first thing in neuroplasticity to develop. So really, if a child doesn't have any visual input before uh, six weeks, seven weeks, they are never going to see. So you have to get, pick up those children right at birth who may have a condition like congenital cataracts, blocking the vision in both eyes, and treat them, operate really within eight or nine weeks to try to get the vision back. And if you miss that opportunity, that's it, they're going, to never, they're going to have severe visual impairments the rest of their life, and that's a huge personal and social, social, societal uh, cost um, of, of visual impairment for the rest of their life. So most of the screenings, I say, is done by non-specialists, and particularly this is an issue in uh, very rural areas, uh, and particularly developing countries where the screeners, you don't know, have trained screeners available. So technology hopefully will make the job easier. So one of the first things I developed was uh, a, a camera called NearCam, which um, is incredibly simple, actually, <laughs> uh, because it's just using infrared rather than white light. The problem when you use a white light ophthalmoscope, which is the, like, a, like a torch where you're looking at the eye, you get a red reflex, and you can see that in the picture on the left-hand side. That's almost like the red eye from a flash photo. And midwives use this technique to screen all babies just after birth for congenital cataract. And the GP repeats this test six to eight weeks later as a sort of safety net check. Um, we know that about 50% of kids who have congenital cataracts, this is missed. So the screening is quite poorly sensitive. And also we have the issue that uh, for ethnic patients, for black or Asian patients, the reflex, the color of the reflex is quite different. And they often get sent as false positives. So they have a, you know, weeks of anxiety before they get sent to a specialist, only for the specialist to say, everything's absolutely fine. This is just the way your baby, baby looks. 
Um, so both of those problems, poor sensitivity and poor specificity, are real issues. A lot of developing countries have specialist cataract centers now, so the baby, if they're spotted early, can get the surgery, but the problem, of course, is spotting them early. Um, and so NearCam has actually been trialed uh, by my colleagues in London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in Uganda, Tanzania, um, to, to see if that helps with the pickup of congenital cataracts, and that was quite a successful trial. And running on the back of that, we've actually now got a three-year trial just about to start, a UK trial funded by the NIHR, um, which will allow us to compare the sensitivity and specificity of red reflex, our standard examination, to the examination with um, NearCam. So as I say, NearCam, as you see the picture on the right-hand side, is um, it, 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 it uses infrared, so it doesn't get the pupil constriction, which is a real problem in babies. Uh, and you can actually see the cataract really well highlighted on that bright reflex. You can see it as a dark, uh, a dark spot. And hopefully I can convince you that it's much easier to see on the right-hand side that there's a problem there rather than the left-hand side. So the, the, the child with the cataract on the left-hand side was missed, but perhaps if you'd been able to screen with a near cam, you would have picked that one up um, and the child would have been referred earlier. And early referral and early management, as I said, is the bottom line to getting good outcome. So this little Millie, Millie's now 17, so I feel very ancient when I show this slide. So this is her before her operation. So she had bilateral cataracts, and what tends to happen is babies don't see very well is they lose their stability of visual fixation and you end up with nystagmus like she shows. And this is her after her surgery. So she actually, um, now she's 16, 17, she's actually got perfect vision in each eye. But the main thing for her is she was caught early, we operated early, and we got to her sight back. The problem often for me in clinic is I'm, I'm seeing now, I'm referred a child who may be a year or two old who's got um, a cataract, and I don't know, even though they were screened, whether that cataract was present right at birth or whether it's developed subsequently, because they can. And that makes such a big difference to the prognosis you can offer the patient. If you know the cataract wasn't there and you've got a picture to show you that it wasn't there, then you say, yes, let's go for it, let's do the operation, and you've got a good chance of getting good vision. But if the cataract was right there at birth but it was just missed, then the prognosis is much worse and the parents might decide not to, not to have an operation. So th these things are really important to decision making. So the next stage of screening that all children have is at school in reception year. And that's because 20% 20 20 of kids either suffer from, from lazy eye, amblyopia, um, we call it, or from glue ear and re repeated sort of fluctuating hearing loss. Um, so vision screening is done pretty well I say pretty well, but only actually half of local authorities have screening programs for this. Uh, and the idea is to catch these kids who are four or five who might have vis poor vision in one eye or need glasses to correct vision um, in order to equalize it. Um, and if you catch them early, you can do the treatment with glasses and patching up until the age of eight, and then the vision is set in stone. So you've got that period of time to try and work on the vision to get it better for the rest of their life. Uh, if you have poor vision in one eye, you actually have an increased chance of losing vision in your other eye and becoming you know, visually impaired uh, as an adult. So it's an important thing to do. At the moment, it's quite an expensive pro process. It costs about £10 a child. Um, but I've created a programme called uh, Digivis, which uh, will support this and allows non-trained individuals to test vision at any point they want to at school using an, uh, a web app. And it's also been extremely useful during the COVID crisis for remote consultation and hopefully into the future to try and to improve our rates of um, remote consultation. The NHS long-term plan is asking us to, to do about a third of uh, consultations remotely. And in fact, um, my experience of using this clinically at Addenbrooke's is that a lot of parents really love the fact that they can rely on doing the, remote, doing the vision for themselves at home whenever they want, whenever they've got a worry, and also it prevents them having to come to a clinic, often quite a long way away, because we're dealing with the whole region. As Rob says, it's quite a, quite a large region to travel to come just for a clinic appointment, which may be just to monitor vision. We've been able to space out our clinic appointments so that instead of seeing children every three months, we're able to see them every six months with them doing a Digivis, Digivis test in between. So it's had quite a, a big uh, impact on our clinic capacity, which has been difficult recently, as you can imagine. There's also Digibell, which is another web app which is basically doing the same for hearing. Um, and the, the important thing about hearing for primary school kids is a lot to have glue ear, and they're often labelled mistakenly as being disruptive or... Uh, not quite with it educationally, and it's very difficult to grow out of that label as a child. 
And what DigiBell is, is it'll show you which children might benefit from having uh, use of bone conduction headphones, which is little, uh, a bit like the Aftershocks headphones you can get, which actually transmit sound through bone. They're pretty cheap, uh, and it means that these kids can have these at school to help them um, learn uh, and catch up, basically. And I've been working on this with my colleague Tamsin Brown, who's a paediatrician at Addenbrooke's too. So that's all I have to say. Um, I've had a, quite a hard time innovating, um, and I think I've missed the boat a little bit. I think I'd benefit a lot more if we had the, the innovation hub that we're hoping to develop uh, at the Cambridge Children's, uh, because it has been a bit of a process, and I think if I'd been able to have the exposure to uh, academics within the university, that the engineers, computer scientists, uh, creating these innovations would have been so much uh, easier, and I hope uh, that will be the case for clinicians who have innovational ideas in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions now. So um, I can see we've had some in, and um, we'll start with a discussion between the three of us. So um, I wanted to kick off by asking you to kind of build on what you both talked about around collaborations and the importance of collaborations. Maybe, Rob, you can talk about it in terms of regionally, how we're working with partners acro across the east of England. Yes, yeah, so uh, a key part of um, the provision of child health at Addenbrooke's is the provision of specialist care for the 15 or 16 other uh, district general hospitals around the region. So we very much see ourselves as part of a network of clinicians um, managing children together. And um, this is by no means a large hospital. And so we are really wanting to work closely with, with paediatricians around the region to be able to take children, provide them with a specialist care, and get them clo back close to home um, uh, as soon as possible. And these networks have established and, and are well developed over the last 20 years. So we feel that um, uh, this building will allow us to really be more focused about um, communicating better, about providing um, more efficient, more productive care for children so that we can keep more children in the, in, in the um, communities that, that they come from rather than uh, having them go out of, out of region to London. And Louise, is that, is that the same, would you say that much the yes, same for you? Yes, and I'm hoping also to take it outwards because I've been working, as I say, with my colleagues from London School Hygiene Topical Medicine and I, the hope is once we get uh, through this NIHR trial that NICAM will be something that can be offered to developing countries. And I'm also in discussions uh, with UNICEF actually to use the DigiBell and DigiBiz test. Um, and that could be fantastic. Well, it'd be lovely to think that had been taken and, and actually used in, in developing countries as well to provide cheap, um, effective uh, and accurate, actually, <laughs> um, screening in the developing world. And, and how much is technology changing the way that we can think about healthcare in children? Yeah, well, we never used to do remote consultations in ophthalmology because ophthalmology is something you just need, you know, fundamentally, you need to know what the visual acuity is. It's a fundamental measurement you need to hang your hat on in order to come up with a, a decision making in, in, in our field. And um, before, that's, all, that's always limited our ability to do sort of remote consultations and things like that. But with, with DigiVis, we've actually been able to use the remote consultation and, and prevent, you know, often half of our um, kids having to come back again and again and again, missing school, parents are missing uh, work, uh, all of the transport here and there, parking fees. Ooh. Um, oh, you told me not to mention that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it can have a huge impact on, on kids, yeah. Rob, what about, what about kind of more broadly in the children's hospital? How, how well, I, I think, you know, the, the um, opportunities amongst technology, whether that is remote monitoring, um, we already, you know, our, our diabetes services are using um, apps to remotely monitor um, blood sugars. But I think the, the opportunities of um, telehealth and telemedicine um, perhaps are, are less developed in the UK than there are, they are elsewhere in the world. But we know from partners and collaborators in, in North America, for example, that a good chunk of mental health provision can be done remotely. And actually in, in COVID times, uh, with the sort of massive increase in, in requirement for um, psychological support, our psychologists have um, essentially provided contact uh, online and, and therefore are able to reach children and families, you know, in the outer reaches of, of the region. And I think 
as psychology is, is not well provided for in all, all parts of the region, actually the, the access of these harder to reach families has, has been much improved. And I think um, the opportunities of, of, of telehealth being developed as part of our digital um, work stream are, are, are fantastic. And I think, you know, at least 30% of, of contacts for outpatients are likely to be remote in the future, probably in some specialties, you know, uh, in excess of that, 50, 60%. So we've had some, had some questions in. So um, we've been asked about um, if complementary medicine offers at all will be integrated within the way that we're thinking about care within the children's hospital. Um, uh, the person that's asked it has, has referenced parents looking and, uh, for more and more for this kind of offer for their children, especially in the area of childhood cancer or neonatology. Um, so, yes, wondered, Rob, what you thought about that. Yes, yeah, so I, I think many specialties are, are, are aware of, of, you know, the interest in complementary therapies. And I guess the, the important thing to say is, is um, at least for me personally, uh, complementary therapies should be just that, complementary. So rather than alternative therapies to um, treatments and interventions that we understand, that we've investigated, that we've researched, I think um, there are many um, opportunities, um, theories, hunches, which we don't understand well within conventional medicine. And I would say that um, given our, our ambition to be evidence-based, to be scientific and to understand what the best treatments are for children, um, I would um, see no problem at all in, in working with families, with um, communities around understanding the benefits that come from complementary therapy. How can we add value to what we do already and how can we help understand you know, the impact of those treatments? I might also say that um, empowering parents to be able to monitor their children's so visual acuity or, or other outcomes, which are now available for a lot of the health mm. apps um, and you know, Digiviz, Digibel, you, you can monitor how your children's progressing and it just gives maybe the power and support. So if, if parents want to try something else, um, as well as what we're offering, um, they can try it in the knowledge that they actually can monitor things themselves and have a little bit more buy-in to their, to their child's health. And actually parents and family are a really important part of the, our vision for Cambridge Children's in terms of really thinking about the whole family that are involved in, in children's care. And Rob, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about how that's being sort of brought out in the design. So what, we, what we've um, really found um, uh, incredible is the engagement um, with families around the region. So we put out a call um, for support both for, for hospital users, but also for families around the region. There are in excess of 400 families that are now part of our um, children and families network. They're supporting design discussions. Um, they're supporting discussions around models of care. Um, so each of the work streams that um, are ongoing to develop this hospital, whether it's arts or workforce or fundraising, um, we have got families and, and children engaged um, in helping us develop what in the end is, is a service for them. They were instrumental in, we had a fantastic group of children, instrumental in the, in the selection of the design team and the, and the architects. Um, so it's, it's been a, a real pleasure to see how engaged um, families have become in, in this project. Brilliant. We've actually had a couple of questions um, about the design itself. So. Um, one of them is asking if you can tell us a little bit more about, about the hospital and how it will work cross-discipline. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the hospital will house in total about 120 beds, of which there are about 40 dedicated mental health beds, and the rest are um, inpatient physical health beds, critical care, uh, day case. The... the greatest change I think that we are likely to see is in the shared ward areas. So we have two ward floors for inpatients which are shared, um, each wing of the hospital is shared between a, an age appropriate mental health unit currently um, uh, separate on the, on the Ida Darwin site and an, uh, an equivalent age appropriate group of chil uh, children with medical, con with physical conditions. So 
Each end of the ward is predominantly a mental or physical health area. However, there is an area in between where there, there are swing rooms which, which children can occupy uh, and, and we can flex our spaces. And there are shared dining opportunities, play opportunities, staff opportunities. So that whilst we haven't mixed all children up um, immediately, the opportunities in the design are for us to develop that model as we become more comfortable, as patients and staff become more integrated. There are obviously areas that we need to keep separate for, for safety, for infection control. And so we've, we've tried to, um, and it's been remarkably interesting and challenging, uh, to come up with areas that are genuinely integrated and, and um, have no division, whilst protecting those children who really need individual spaces. Uh, and we hope that over the next three to five years, we will have opportunity, and, and there is already joint teaching and, and training going on, to develop a workforce that will be able to get into this um, way of working as the, as the hospital is built. Louise, is there anything you would, you would add oh, to that? Oh, Rob knows more about the children's <laughs> hospital than I do. <laughs> um, so we've had a question about, about, we've actually had a couple of questions about funding and philanthropy. Um, and I can certainly say a little bit about where, where we think the funding is coming from. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've announced a, uh, a philanthropy campaign, which we did earlier this year. Um, and it's a partnership between the University of Cambridge, Adenbrooke's Charitable Trust and a Head to Toe Charity. Um, and that will be looking to, to match the government funding that we've had committed to the project um, and, and really, you know, builds on the strength of partnerships. We are part of the biomedical campus and therefore we also have an opportunity to work in, in collaboration with industry partners as well. And I can see that there was also a question about that. Um, you know, there's a question here, Rob, about timing and ambition of opening in 2025. And I, I mean, it is an ambitious timeline, isn't it? Yes, it, it, it's a timeline that we, ha we haven't shifted despite the major challenges of COVID. Um, we are, as I said, we, we are submitting planning today. The outline business case, which is the second phase of, of this type of development, is expected to be submitted before the end of the financial year. The government um, uh, are making the sort of noises that um, they will try and process and deliver applications through what's called the new hospitals program effectively and, and swiftly. Um, so whilst it does seem overly ambitious, we are holding on to that title to keep um, both us, the government, and our fundraising team um, cited on the, on the challenge. It's clear that um, our ambitious um, fundraising total of, a, of 100 million pounds is not going to be raised by the time the hospital is open but we are working towards that and expect to raise that in due course. And I think it's, I mean, there's a couple more questions actually here on some of the things we've touched on, but there's also an opportunity, isn't there, to work in partnership with, with, other, with other partners to, to deliver the vision around, for example, telehealth and, and other kind of parts of the hospital. Yes, so we, we've mentioned some of them. There are, there are um, companies on the biomedical campus that we are currently in, in negotiation with to have um, a footprint um, within the research space. There will be around 5,000 square meters of, of dedicated um, child health research, mental and physical health. And we're looking to industry partners um, within Cambridge and medical tech companies to, to be within the building and, and not only contribute to the, the innovation, but also um, contribute to the, to the sort of financial support and, and the long-term partnerships that, that we see the Children's Hospital offering. Um, so just coming back on a couple of questions. So we've had a, quite a few questions from things we've talked about already. So if it's okay, I'll just, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll just go back to a couple of them. Um, we've had a question about, will there be spaces for parents, carers, and families? Um, and there's also been a question around facilities for young teenage patients, which probably builds on what you've been saying, Rob, around the age-appropriate wards. Yes, yeah, so, so we are well aware that at the moment, um, Addenbrookes in particular offers um, little or no um, teenage space. And because we are so constrained on, on bed space, there hasn't really been a protected area. So we have worked very hard to maintain and provide age-appropriate space. This hospital aims to look after young people up to the age of 18, 
we currently look after children up to the age of 16. So it's all the more important to provide um, quiet and, and appropriate spaces um, for, for teenagers and young people, and we've, we've very much focused on that. All the rooms will be single rooms. There won't be open bays. There'll be opportunities to, to share um, uh, single bays between two um, um, bedrooms. But um, the, the, the focus is very much to maintain an, an age-appropriate floor with younger children on a, on a lower floor and, and teenagers um, and teenagers above. In terms of um, space for families, um, unlike um, at the moment when we have a small number of um, family spaces on the campus but separate from the wards, we have got several rooms on each floor um, dedicated to parents staying overnight, as well as several rooms on the intensive care unit for those families who have children admitted uh, in the middle of the night, have no accommodation. So we, we are um, given the pressure on space within the hospital for, for clinical services. We are working hard to protect some family space where it's really essential to be close and, and right next to your, your child. But we, all, we are also working with other partners to develop more um, parent accommodation and family on accommodation on campus so that um, daytime treatment investigations can go ahead um, without you needing a hospital bed. Brilliant. Um, there's, there's a further question about telehealth as well, which, Louise, maybe I can come to you about. Um, there's, a, there's a question around if telehealth becomes much more widely used, how do we manage this for families with poor or no digital access? Mm. And I think that's a question that both is something for us to think about regionally, but, but also internationally, thinking about the partnerships that you've been developing. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a known issue that, that um, individuals with di digital poverty are more likely to be at risk of serious health issues. So um, that definitely has to be grappled with. Um, I think the way I see it working is that we will end up with sort of kiosks, of, uh, kiosks within GP surgeries, libraries, community centres, things like that, which will already be connected to the internet and to remote consultation. So it'll actually make it much easier um, for people who may not know how to connect, may not have the digital devices at home to be able to use it. I think that is one aspect of it. The other is, in some ways, by identifying the people who are digitally poor, you're more, you are identifying people who actually probably need face-to-face -face care. Um, and by improving the capacity within our system, by using remote consultation, you can actually free up face-to-face -face capacity and actually make sure the people who need it get it. Um, so we are, we are coming to the close of our session. I just wanted to ask um, sort of two final questions. One is around transition. Um, so, Rob, you mentioned that the, the children's hospital will go up to the age of 18. How is that transition then to adult care services being planned? So I, I think one of the, um, one of the many uh, uh, sort of um, uh, fantastic and, and, and arguably unique opportunities for the Addenbrooke's campus and a children's hospital is that on the same campus we have a group of outstanding adult um, surgeons, clinicians that are already supporting us with transitioning the, the um, children with chronic complex conditions from childhood through into adulthood. What we um, are working on is how the age range of 16 to 18 will best be cared for. So there will almost certainly be 16, 17, 18 year olds who are better placed in an adult um, service on, uh, in the main hospital whilst there are certainly children who've come up through paediatric care who um, will be much better served with a, uh, a service run in a children's hospital. However, with adult clinicians on site and able to reach into the children's hospital to continue um, uh, their care from um, when they're young through to um, uh, their care when, when they're adults. So I think for, particularly for those children who are um, more challenging and have more complex health needs, I think the transition within Addenbrooke's is something that, that can only improve. I think around the region, um, we would hope to be able to develop better transition to local hospitals um, for young people through better um, communication platforms, through better telehealth, through better communication um, via the, the patient um, medical records. Um, so I think there, there are real great opportunities to, to make that um, transition more seamless. 
And, and Louise, would you, would you agree with that in terms of what's Oh, abs yeah? absolutely. I mean, the number of patients who are, who are maybe seen by a specialised service at Addenbrooke's but get referred to ophthalmology for a specialised service, but actually they don't need to be seen at Addenbrooke's. They could be seen in Yarmouth or Norwich or, you know, Luton or, or somewhere like that, and, and yet they're dragged back to Cambridge to be seen. If we had better communications between the hospitals, that would be fantastic. <laughs> For everybody. <laughs> and I think it's something we've talked about, isn't it, about building a smart hospital and not necessarily the biggest hospital. And that was just the final thing I wanted just to touch on, which is around sustainability and the importance of, of building a, you know, a, a green hospital. Um, and, and Rob, you know, you had a, a couple of images of outdoor spaces in your slides. I didn't know if there was something more you could say about yes, that. Yes, uh, so I, I'm, I'm probably not the most expert on, on um, sustainability, but I, I guess there, there is a clear focus and an ambition um, to make this you know, one of the, the, the first net zero um, uh, hospitals for the, for the NHS. And uh, it has come across loud and clear from our engagement with children and families that they see this as a key element of um, uh, uh, the, this type of building for children. Children are our future. And of course, we should be making the, the hospital sustainable. So there, there's real focus on sustainable materials, um, access to outdoor and availability of green space. There are courtyards which are bringing light into the building. Um, and, and I think the, the um, focus of our design team has really tried to maintain that despite all of the challenges of cost and um, uh, the sort of developments that, that um, we need to incorporate. So I think, you know, in terms of building design, we are absolutely focused on that. Um, it, it, it does have some um, uh, cost implications for the building as a whole, but I think it's also important to say that, that the hospital itself has to become sustainable in itself, in that we need to be able to attract and retain outstanding staff if we are to continue to develop and, and um, improve outcomes for children. And so there's also a real focus on, on supporting staff and, and providing adequate staff provision and, and spaces, training, opportunities to develop um, in order that um, we can maximise the, the benefits of the hospital. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think there are quite a few questions that we won't be able to get to in the time we've got today. I, I just wanted to, to bring the session to a close by asking how people can get involved if they want to and, and the different, different kind of networks that we've set up um, as a way to bring people together um, and, and enable people to have a say in how the hospital's developed. Well, the, the, you won't have to look very far if you um, <laughs> put Cambridge Children's uh, in, into Google. There are um, uh, ways to join us in on, via the Cambridge Children's um, Hospital website. Um, there's contacts uh, through our comms team um, at Addenbrooke's and, and at CPFT. I know there is, there is um, contact to the fundraising efforts via the same website. You know, we would, de we would be delighted, uh, as we have been already, to hear from anyone who feels they have a, a view, an opinion, ideas um, to support uh, our, our mission. Um, and, you know, it, it would be fantastic to get, to get people behind this project. Um, and Louise, is there any kind of final, final note you wanted to sort of share with us? Um... Well, I, I think we're going the right way as far as innovation is concerned. I think innovation has to be led by clinicians because we know where the patient need is. And I, I think the great thing that will come from this development is our ability to talk with the wealth of knowledge there is out there in the university who we don't actually see from day to day. And just to have that input um, would make things an awful lot easier. Brilliant. Um, so thank you very much, Rob and Louise. It's been a, a really interesting, um, really interesting talk. I hope everyone's really enjoyed it. Um, as Rob mentioned, um, we have a website. It's cambridgechildrens.org.uk. Um, do go online and have a look. If there's any questions we haven't got to today, I think there's an opportunity to, to, um, to send questions through the website. Please do that. And, um, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, Gabby.